The first one is easy, and it is the e-books. And by the way, you'll see there's a picture of a cat, and there's a reason for that. And it really is because the American Library Association, I talked to one of their marketing people one time, and what they actually said was that when they put up the American Library Association store, that any piece of merchandise that they bought that had a cat on it, librarians would buy. <laughs> it would always sell out. So when I heard that, ever since I heard that, I found this image on the internet with a cat and a book. And I thought any time that I have something that might be viewed as bad news for an audience, that I'd use this picture on the slide <laughs> because any element of bad news could perhaps be mitigated a little bit by the fact that, hey, he's showing a cat, you know? So <laughs> that's the reason the cat is actually there. But um, the point of the slide, and perhaps the bad news for some, is that when we talk about ebooks, even though it does only constitute five, six percent of the circulation for many library systems, or even less than that, is that many of the people in the general public that currently say, well, I'm not going to read an ebook. I don't like ebooks. I like it when it's print. You know, I like it when I can hold it. I like, I like a real book, and that's what I hope libraries continue to be about. That's what I want is a real book. Many of the people who say they won't read ebooks will, and they'll be reading them very soon three to four years. And the reasons for it are exceptionally simple. And it is because the publishing industry is going through a more rapid change, a more dramatic change, a more fundamental change, and one they have to go through in order to survive than public libraries are. And when you talk to publishers, what they really say is, you know what, we're not gonna publish literary fiction in print formats anymore. We have to sell 3,000 copies in order to break even when it comes to literary fiction. And there are so many places that disappeared in terms of bookstores where we can sell our material that we can't manage to sell 3,000 copies. So if we're going to do literary fiction, the only way we're going to be able to make it so we can afford it is to only produce it in electronic format. Then you talk to them and they say, you know, first-time authors have always been a money loser for publishers, always. And we hope that we can build a following for those first-time authors and that eventually their second book or their third book or their fourth book will start to make some money for us. But if we do it in an ebook format instead of a print format, then maybe we can publish a few more first time authors. Because a first time author in Canada, a mid list author, used to sell 7,000 copies. A mid list author at the present time sells 3,000 copies. That's break even. That's not a first time author. That's an established author that's written two or three books and it has a following of people that actually like to read. So there isn't much room for publishers to make any other options other than to say ebook is the way in which we're looking in order to make a money because we can make money with smaller components and smaller sales spread out over a longer period of time. The same is true of backlist titles. And you probably know that traditionally a publisher has to know that they have 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 potential sales before they will reprint a book for backlist. And yet, if they do it in ebook because they've already printed it once and it's already available, then they can continue to make it available. And if they sell 200 copies a year or 150 copies a year, they can still make a little bit of money on that title and the author still has the title that was actually there in print. So the net result of all of this is that within two, three, four years, what we're going to be seeing is the more popular books will be printed in print formats and in electronic formats, but backlist titles, literary fiction titles, and such things as new authors will only be printed for many publishers in an electronic book format. Huge implications for public libraries and for our collections themselves. But it does mean that those people who love certain authors who discover them and then want to read everything they've written in terms of a backlist copy will have to read it on an ebook. So many of the people, as I say, who say they won't read an ebook, they're going to wind up reading them because that's where the authors that they want to read are going to be. And why is this actually going to happen? And really, you can, to a certain extent, and I put this in there because a lot of us can remember it, is you remember the reference book where 12 or 13 years ago when so many reference books were available in print and then they began to be available in electronic por formats or in databases. And then the print copy of the book, because not as many people were buying the print, became more and more and more expensive. 
And eventually, nobody could afford the print, and so they began to disappear. Well, the same thing is happening in terms of e-books, and it's happening much faster. That is, the print runs get shorter and shorter and shorter. If you can't make your money on the 3,000, then maybe it's a 2,000 run in order to do it, then you have to charge more for each one of those 2,000 copies of the print copy to actually make it work. So as I say, many of the people that say that they're not going to read e-books, they will, or else they won't be reading as many books or can, uh, quite so many. I love this slide. And what it really is talking about is that when we talk about e-books, and I'm still on that topic and will be for a little while, to me they're like the horseless carriage. And when the horseless carriage first came along and that sort of was like a car, then people had to identify it and define it according to what it resembled in the past. So they said, you know, it's a carriage, but it doesn't have a horse. And we're doing the same thing with the e-book. What we're actually saying is, it's a book, but it's electronic. <laughs> and to an extent, what happened then with the next stage of the horseless carriage is it became something very different as an art form. No longer was it a horseless carriage, it was an automobile, or it was a car. It was something that's very different and kind of divorced from that initial reality and not thought of any longer as being a horseless carriage. And that's what we're beginning to see with the e-books is because they're being designed and thought of as an electronic product first instead of as an e-product first, then it's going to change the nature of the book considerably. And in fact, one of the things that's going to happen is that right now, much of the interest in e-books centers around fiction, is it'll bring nonfiction back into the fold and make it so that many more books will be produced in nonfiction because the, abil the ability to use graphics and to use images to, prevent, to present nonfiction in interesting ways is absolutely amazing in terms of e-books. And I'll show you a couple of examples. And the first one is my absolute favorite. <coughs> and this one, is from the informationisbeautiful.net site. And if you read the report, then it's certainly cited in there so that you can see it. And it's an interactive uh, graphic form where what it is, is it's a bubble chart. It's called a bubble race, actually, when you do deal with them. And this one deals with uh, homeopathic or holistic uh, health cures. And uh, the size of the bubble is actually the amount of information that exists on the internet about that particular item. So there's quite a bit of information about folic acid, there's not quite as much information about uh, fish oils or omega-3. There's clearly a lot of information about green tea, about coconut oil and honey, because those are the bigger bubbles. The higher the bubble is on the chart, and you can see partway through where it says, it says the worth it line, is the higher the bubble on the chart, the more uh, validated information exists to suggest that this is actually a decent cure or a decent treatment or uh, effective when used for a particular type of ailment. And if you were to actually touch the fol folic acid or the garlic, it'll suggest the ailment that you might want to consider it for. But over at the side, what it has is a number of different types of parameters that you can sort of set yourself. You can put your age, you can tell them you're diabetic, you can tell them you're a little bit overweight. You can tell them information about yourself, and as you do that, and you can even tell them the condition that you're interested in, then suddenly the bubbles will shift. Some bubbles will move down because there is no evidence that suggests that it's useful for the condition that you're identifying, or because it's really useful for women, but there's no evidence that it's useful for men. So the bubbles will move back and forth. And, and when you touch the bubble, or when you put it over the cursor and actually touch it, what it will do is take you to the actual information that supports, or the research that supports, why that bubble has been placed in that particular location. So it tells you the evidence that is behind it. Now, the point that I really want to make is that this, in many respects, is beginning to, ex uh, to show what a table of contents might look like in the next generation of ebooks because it does exactly what a table of contents is intended to do. It manages to take you to the information that you are interested in. And in this instance, what it's doing is doing what the net can do very well, what uh, uh, computers can do very well, is it's taking that graphic information, but then it's combining it with the written information that is actually behind it. And in fact, I'm gonna go out of the slide presentation for just a second and show you that uh, this is a new book just came out last Sunday. Uh, there was a book before called Ecological Urbanism. You can buy it at chapters. In fact, I saw it in chapters just the other day. 
And what the book itself is about is about urban situations where there are sort of echo initiatives that exist. And the publishers of the book finally decided that this whole issue of uh, ecological urbanism is changing so quickly that it wouldn't work in a book form, that they needed to have it be interactive where they continued to add information onto the book itself. So they put the book online and they made it into an app. And you can see there are a number of bubbles, and some of the bubbles actually uh, correspond to places in the world. And if you touch it, what it will actually do is tell you about the Echo City and begin to give you the details of that particular item. So they're using a form of the bubble chart in order to direct you to the information. So this is exactly what I'm talking about as being that next generation of book. I love this one too. Because what it actually do is wire, wire ecological urbanism and then it gives you the landscape, the ecology, urbanism, the economy, the infrastructure and if you touch each one of those it's like touching an, another section of the book and opening up chapters that will then take you to the text that is part of it. So to go back to the presentation, this is another example of it. And the term that they use for a lot of this is transliteracy. And uh, I'm, I have a, a link in the report that takes you to a very good article produced by the University of California at Santa Barbara that talks about transliteracy and why it is useful and why in many respects it's the first new art form of the 21st century. And in the 20th century, you saw a lot of art forms that were taking you away from print. I mean, it was movies and radio and, and television. But I find it interesting that what they're saying is the first new art form of the 21st century transliteracy is one that actually incorporates text as part of it because text is the end result. This one is absolutely terrific. It's from the New York Times. Uh, and what it is is it's a display of the 2012 United States uh, federal budget. And the size of each one of the bubbles corresponds to the amount of money that that particular component of the budget takes. So the very large bubble that's on the upper right-hand corner is the defense budget. And the higher the bubble is in the chart, it means that there's an increase in spending, in spending on that particular area. And the lower the bubble is on the chart, it means there's a decrease in spending in the bubble in that particular area. And again, if you run your cursor or your finger over any of the particular details, it will tell you specifically what area of the budget, what program, what project, and then if you touch it, then it will take you to the detailed information that supports why that bubble is in that particular area. So again, it's like a, a, a picture table of contents that takes a complex idea and manages to convey that in a different way. So this is the type of thing that we're going to begin to see in ebooks, not just novels, but nonfiction. And in fact, to a great extent, it's a way that libraries can reconnect with nonfiction. To give you some idea of how pervasive it's becoming, is there even the public site, such as graphically and visually, and I'm a member of both of them, where people can take their own information and take their own documents and convert them to those types of charts and those types of, of bubbles and then publish them as, as EPUB publications. 